So here we are, we're going to cover a critical step during a motion capture experiment where we calibrate the volume, we put markers on a subject, we have them move and characterize their motion. I will be uh, working with Master Hannah O'Day, who is about to finish her PhD in biomechanics, and Dr. Scott Ulrich, who very recently finished his PhD in biomechanics. So let's go ahead and uh, get started. Scott, take it over. Yeah. So the first step before we start any motion capture experiment is calibrating our space. So you, are, you saw the cameras around the top of the room, and they need to know where they are relative to our force plates, and they also need to know where they are relative to one another. So the first step, we use a rigid calibration frame like this. Excuse me, Hannah. And we put it down to establish our lab origin. So here it's the corner of one of our force plates, and we have four markers, and so we can uh, we can establish the ground frame and then the vertical uh, direction is orthogonal to this. So um, we would capture a single frame of this and then we would take this up and wave our calibration wand around the capture volume. So for about a minute we would just be waving this around. What this does, we have three markers at a very known distance that are all perfectly collinear along this rod. And so we know the 3D uh, relative positions and orientations of these markers. So um, all of the cameras can figure out what their position and orientation is in the world from um, first the static frame and then as we wave this around. So once we've calibrated the frame, then the subject would come in, who is Hannah, and we'd start putting some motion capture markers on her. Um, and depending on the, the study we want to do, we might put, if we really cared about foot biomechanics, we might put a ton of markers on her feet. But today we'll just characterize uh, the motion of her, her right leg. So we're going to assume that her foot is a single rigid body, which it's not, but for the purposes of today, we'll say that everything is rigid in the foot. So we're going to need a minimum of three markers that aren't collinear in the foot. So Scott can help me put some of these on here. And what we're looking for is a very repeatable location um, that we can identify in the same way in every single subject. Two great places to do it on the ankle are the medial and lateral malleolus, which are kind of the bumps on your ankle. So we'll do that. Medial malleolus here. So these two markers I just put on, the medial and lateral malleolus, if you draw a line between them, they define the axis of the ankle quite well. The midpoint between these two markers is the, what we typically use as the ankle joint center. Great. And then we also put some markers on the foot here, so you could put them kind of wherever you want. We typically um, find the second met metatarsal head, which is where the second toe attaches to the foot. So we palpate on top of the shoes, put it there, and then we also put one on the fifth metatarsal head out there. And then finally, the last one on the foot, we'll put one roughly on the, the back of the calcaneus, so somewhere over here. If you want to do the fifth metatarsal head one there. Great, so now we have enough markers to characterize the, the orientation of the foot in the world. Um, now we want to characterize the, um, the shank. So like Scott said, if we assume that the, the um, ankle markers are the fixed axis of the ankle, we can actually assume that these markers are fixed in both the foot and the shank. So we can use them for both. Uh, but we want to define um, where the knee joint axis is. So we're going to put two markers on the medial and lateral femoral epicondyles, which are the most prominent um, points on the outside of the femur. So to do this, it can be helpful to have the patient um, go through a range of motion and kind of palpate along here. Um, the IT band comes along the outside and can kind of make it hard to find the lateral malleolus. Go ahead and extend and flex. Great. Okay, so here's the medial malleolus. Thank you. Here's the lateral malleolus. All right, so now we, we can establish anatomical reference frames for both the foot and the shank. Um, but as you've seen in lectures, sometimes we also want a tracking reference frame. And the reason for that is that we'll take off these medial markers during experiments so that Hannah doesn't uh, rub them off if she's walking and running. And also because when her legs are passing by one another, the, um, the markers get occluded from the cameras. And you want the maximum number of markers, or excuse me, the maximum number of cameras to see a marker at any given time to get a really accurate 3D location. 
So for the, the shank, we'll put on this um, tracking frame, and it doesn't really matter where it is on the limb. We just want it to not move throughout the duration of the experiment. So we'll just strap that to the outside of her, her shank here. And this has three markers on it, so we could, just from this plate alone, we can establish a, a tracking reference frame. Um, and these are orthogonal, so it's a good, um, good set of markers to um, establish that frame. So before we started the experiment, we'd have Hannah stand in a static pose, and we would uh, come up with the transformation matrix between the anatomical frame on her shank and the tracking frame here. And then through all the dynamic trials, we would be tracking her um, tracking reference frame. Just to anchor that a little bit, you can imagine a reference frame here, so a X, Y, Z reference frame here, and also ones that are established by these anatomical landmarkers. That gives us the ability to transform from one reference frame to another. Now, when we get up to the hip, we've established the, um, the, ankle, um, the ankle joint as well as the knee joint, assuming that those are pin joints, but the hip is a three degree of freedom rotation joint, and we can't put markers on the center of the hip joint, obviously. And so we want to know where the hip joint is so we can know the origin of the femur. So what we commonly do is, is create a do a, a functional um, trial to create uh, a functional reference frame and understand the functional hip joint center. So Hannah would move her hip through a large range of motion here. And we'd have, we'd have markers on her pelvis as well as on her femur, kind of like we did on the shank. And we would find the point that is uh, moving the least in both the femur and the pelvis, and we would call that the hip joint center. And we'd establish a transformation between the, this would be the tracking frame on her, her thigh, so we would find the position of the hip joint center relative to this frame. And then for all the dynamic trials, we can know where her hip joint center is without ever putting a marker on it. Knowing these joint centers is quite helpful. So now we know from these two markers, the ankle center, from these two markers, roughly the knee center, and from that functional trial, we're looking at the hip joint center. So we know how the limb is aligned. Uh, I think to emphasize also, Scott mentioned we would need markers on the pelvis because we need to get the orientation of the pelvic reference frame and the femoral reference frame, and it's that rotation of the femur relative to the pelvis, that fixed point, gives us the hip joint center. So now that we have the markers established, we can move on to a, 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 the next stage of a motion capture experiment.